Om Magyan Timirandasya Gerajara Salakaya Chaksu Un Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurudevena Maha Shri Chaitanya Manobhistam Stapti Tam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swa Padanti Kam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamani Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaur Vani Pacharine Nirvishesha Sunyavadi Pastyatya De Sitarine Vanchakopa Tarubis Chakripa Sindhu Pavacha Patitanam Bhavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namaho Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Sivasati Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Such a gigantic subject to cover. <clears throat> I was thinking where to start or where to end. <laughs> but I, there's different aspects about Srila Prabhupada we could focus on. Um, I guess one of the things that is important to understand is that, you know, that we all have a direct connection with Srila Prabhupada. Sometimes there's a mistaken idea that those who are disciples, they're connected, they have direct, and we have less direct or indirect. But that is not correct at all, even in the slightest amount. Because Prabhupada is the founder, Acharya, of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. And therefore, as Prabhupada said, anyone who comes into this movement has a direct connection with himself. Through his books, through his instructions, through the activities of devotional service as performed within the society. So, uh, one should not think anything less um, there are many examples where persons who have never even met Srila Prabhupada have received instructions from Srila Prabhupada in either in dreams or through other persons who are connected with Srila Prabhupada. So our connection is, um, is based on the principle as uh, Bhakti Vinod Thakur has written. Uh, he reasons ill who say that Vaishnavas die when thou art living still in sound. Vaishnavas die to live, and in living, spread the holy name around. <clears throat> die, they, Vaishnavas die to live, that means that uh, they live always on the eternal platform. And although they may appear to us at different times, just like the sun appears and it disappears, but the sun is somewhere in its orbit. So the great souls, they come. As, as a mercy manifestation of the Supreme Lord to give us the opportunity to perfect our lives and go back home, back to Godhead. Srila Prabhupada is unbeknownst to a, some, maybe not everybody, but he was predicted in the Shastras by Krishna himself. Krishna, there's a dialogue in the Brahmanda Purana where Krishna is speaking, it's Krishna, and that's not any incarnation of Krishna. He's speaking to Ganga Devi himself, herself, the personification of the Ganga and the Ganges River. And he says that uh, within the next 5,000 years, a personality will come and take my name and spread it throughout the world. He called that person Mantra Upasaka. In other words, that person who will make the holy name known everywhere and everywhere, anywhere and everywhere throughout the world. And then, of course, there was a dialogue between Narada Muni and uh, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, where also there was a prediction made that a great soul will soon come and spread the, the holy name. And, of course, finally, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, in his vision, seeing all the races chanting Jai Sachi Nandana. Jai Sachi Nandana was a vision he had. It wasn't a dream, it was a vision in Sri Mayapur. And he could understand some soon, someday, a personality will come 
and unite people all over the world from the different races into the glorification of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So Prabhupada is not someone who was somehow or other fortunate enough to become a great spiritual master and somehow started a movement. All this was orchestrated all the way from the top down. <laughs> but still, that doesn't uh, anyway diminish the qualities and greatness of Srila Prabhupada. Aside from his philosophical teachings and his immense writings and everything he did, he was very personal. And you can see in this last uh, episode here on the video how he was just passing out flowers to his devotees and the devotees were offering flowers back. There are many stories how Prabhupada, of course Prabhupada's previous, early part of his life he was a pharmacist and therefore he knew medicine quite well. I think in Maharaj's books, book about health, you'll find so many quotes about Srila Prabhupada giving advice on medical help, on diets, and various types of things that are been, meant for health. So Prabhupada was always concerned about the health of his devotees. And at times when devotees were sick and he found out about it, he would uh, make a personal, uh, you know, he would say something that he would help or give some advice either directly or indirectly to that person. There's that famous... Uh, story where Prabhupada was in Sri Vidhan Mayapur and it was Guru Puja. And it was a you know, very enthusiastic chanting and the devotees were offering flowers to Srila Prabhupada. They were coming up one after another. So one devotee, his name was Bhagwat, big devotee, he had come and he offered uh, his flowers to Prabhupada. Prabhupada noticed on his leg there was a pretty significant cut open cut on his leg. So Prabhupada called him over. And this is now, and Prabhupada's being glorified with Kirtan. So he calls him over and he says, are you, are you getting, are you treating that? Are you taking care of it? And the devotee was a little shocked. <laughs> In the middle of the Kirtan, Prabhupada is asking about the cut on his leg. And uh, he said, Yes, Prabhupada. And Prabhupada immediately turned to his secretary, was sitting next to him, and said, "Give me a pencil and paper." And he wrote down some medicine on the on the paper and gave it to the devotee and said, "Here, get this." <laughs> right during the key, right during Guru Puja when he's being worshipped. This is an indication how much Prabhupada was concerned about the devotee, not only on the spiritual level but on all levels. Prabhupada was very personal. Uh, he was like everyone's father. At the same time, he was also everyone's spiritual master. He was, in many sense, a friend to everyone. He exhibited many of the qualities of relationships that people have with different people in the ideal sense. And this endeared the devotees to Prabhupada even more so. Sometimes we see when a spiritual master is just in that one vein of giving instructions and accepting service, the relationships don't develop as strong. But when there is this mood of, because the mood of a spiritual master to the disciple is like father to daughter, father to son. That's how it's seen and that's how it's understood. As Prabhupada would probably, one time Prabhupada said, you know, I had, in my early part of my life, I had a wife and so many children. And now that is all finished. But now I have 300 children and no botheration of wife. <laughs> so he wanted to make a point that, you know, all the, his disciples were like his children. And in many letters, he would address his devotees, my dear sons and daughters, <laughs> when he wouldn't make a, a, uh, more of like a decoration letter to his devotees. He would address them as sons and daughters. And they saw him like that, not just uh, just a, a powerful spiritual uh, proponent of religious principles that was traveling around the world and writing books, but someone who was very, very personal. Now I'll switch a little bit to some of the 
things that maybe we can benefit in terms of what is some of the most important instructions that Prabhupada gave us. Of course, to put instructions into categories is sometimes is to minimize, but Prabhupada did give us ones that were, what we say, very poignant and something that was fundamental in a broader sense. When Srila Prabhupada was asked, what is your most important instruction? And this was interesting because devotees ask Prabhupada everything. <laughs> And Prabhupada answered, he said, My most important instruction to my disciples is every day they chant 16 rounds on beads without fail. <laughs> so there we go with him. He's making the emphasis that this chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra on beads with our numerical vow is very pleasing to the spiritual master. And it's very fundamental to our progress in Krishna consciousness. Another time, Prabhupada Giriraj Brahmachari, now he is Giriraj Maharaj, was taking care of Prabhupada. And sometimes Prabhupada would get such inspirations and ideas at any time, and he would like to share it with his, some of his leading disciples. So this was in, uh, Prabhupada was doing his, uh, his, uh, what we say, translation. This was in the early morning hours. And Prabhupada got in and started to think about a particular point. And he uh, rang his bell. Giriraj was, uh, Giriraj Brahmachari was sleeping outside the door. Immediately he woke up. Hearing the bell, Prabhupada would keep that bell there to call his disciples when he needed it. And uh, he called Giriraj in. Giriraj is still a little sleepy, pays his obeisances. Prabhupada looks at him and then says, How will this movement go on once I leave? And that was the, you know, point. So I guess from what we hear from the account, Gary Rod said, well, you know, the devotees will go out on Sankirtan, they'll distribute your books, will take part in, you know, the temple programs. In other words, he was just mentioning all the activities that we normally do. But then Prabhupada stopped and li after listening to him, he said, Prabhupada said, this movement will go on by organization and intelligence. <laughs> By organization and intelligence. This one is for the temple president. <laughs> or all leaders should know this. That Prabhupada said, we are highly organized. <laughs> Sometimes people make a joke about our society because in the old days, and maybe even today we still lack what is called the organizations that's required to get things done in an efficient and in a proficient or a speedy way. <laughs> but uh, Prabhupada said, organization, he said, we are highly organized. <laughs> and he said, intelligence, the intelligence means how to adopt that organization in such a way that everything that we do will have the maximum amount of participation the maximum amount of uh, effect, like that. So this was another important instruction that Prabhupada had given us. That when Srila Prabhupada was asked, and it was interesting, it's interesting because Prabhupada said the Americans, they don't accept things so easily. <laughs> That's our culture. <laughs> Prabhupada's, because he was talking to the Indians at this particular time, because a lot of times the Indians will listen and they'll, they won't say anything and they'll just, Swamiji, whatever you say is good. But uh, the <laughs> but Americans weren't like that because they, they had this, what we say, spirit of doubting <laughs> authority. <laughs> so... But they were always respectful. We were always respectful to Prabhupada. But yet, we asked him a lot of questions that sound sometimes even breach the etiquette of relationship. 
and sometimes appear to be even challenging. But one question that devotees had asked Prabhupada was, when you're gone, you know, that's a hard question to ask somebody. <laughs> when you leave us, <laughs> here he is still here. When you leave us, how, will, how can we associate with you? How can we associate with you? And Prabhupada said, you read my books. He said, I am in my books. You simply read my books and you you can associate me through my writings. And Prabhupada said, my Bhaktivedanta purports are my transcendental ecstasies in, um, in my relationship with Krishna. In other words, these are not just philosophical explanations, but there is the 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 uh, loving expression of Prabhupada's relationship with with his with the Supreme Lord that takes the part of Prabhupada's uh, Bhakti Vedanta purports. I want to tell a personal stories which I told maybe once or twice before, but it kind of illustrates this particular point. I don't want to sound very any special, but it helps me to make this point more clear, is that I was sitting in my room in Chicago, and I was the, the non-resident resident, sannyasi. They used to call me the non-resident resident, <laughs> because I was never there. <laughs> but, I, but officially I was, a, I was you know, registered as the resident sannyasi. So one time I was in my room and I was reading Bhagavatam and I had been reading for quite a long time, just reading the Bhagavatam, just going through. And uh, it came to the point where I really got absorbed in the reading. And in that absorption, something changed. Uh, I was no longer reading the words. The words were being spoken to me by the voice of Prabhupada. It was clear. It was like I was listening to a recording of Prabhupada's voice. As I was reading each word, I could hear his voice speak the words. And this went on for some time. It didn't just come and leave. It went on for a while. And then at one point, it stopped. It never happened to me again. But I, I got the message that Prabhupada wanted me to understand. I'm in my books. <laughs> Read my books, I'm personally here. So this was an experience that really made this principle, this point that Prabhupada made, what we say, clear, completely clear. That yeah, when we we can associate with Srila Prabhupada through his books, of course we associate with him through his instructions, but in particular, his books. As Prabhupada, you've seen on this particular video how much emphasis Prabhupada put on his books and both in writing his books and in distributing his books. So this becomes the glory of the devotee and the yatran when we make this a, a what we say, a, a principle of focus, uh, reading Prabhupada's books and distribute them as much as we can. And that pleases Srila Prabhupada. And to please the spiritual master means to please Krishna. There's no difference in, in the, the principle of devotion. Uh, there are many humorous stories in the life of Srila Prabhupada that really indicated Srila Prabhupada's wit and his uh, all-knowing ability. Uh, one time the devotees wanted to see what Prabhupada was doing in his private room. So there was a particular door, and the door had a pretty big keyhole. I think they were in some mansion type place. So one devotee decided to look through the keyhole. And what they saw back was an eye looking at them. <laughs> you watching me, but I'm watching you. <laughs> So that was a little bit of a shock. <laughs> Another little interesting story, and of course this story is told in with some different details as it's told, but as I heard it, there was one devotee 
who really wanted to get Srila Prabhupada's shoes. Prabhupada was in Vrindavan. And he would go from his room in Vrindavan to the temple and put his shoes on. And then when he'd get to his room, he'd take them off outside the room and then go in. So this devotee very carefully was watching Prabhupada and thinking, hmm, I'm going to get those shoes. <laughs> you know, Prabhupada's shoes, that's very, you know, sacred. And so he went to the market, found the exact same shoes and the exact size. <laughs> So now his plan was in, was moving forward. So after watching for some time, he was ready. So now Prabhupada came back from the temple. And this time, just when the devotee was going to make the switch, Prabhupada walked into the room with his shoes on. <laughs> just at the time when he was going to make the switch. And the devotee was thinking, he never does that. <laughs> But this time, just when the switch was about to happen. So the next day in class, Prabhupada was giving a class and he said, you shouldn't try to play tricks on your spiritual master. <laughs> How did he know? Nobody knew. <laughs> but Prabhupada could sense. He had this extra sense, you might say, his, his spiritual sense that he could understand things that... We, even though we may perceive it with our senses, we wouldn't be able to, to understand it. This was Prabhupada. Very powerful. They say when Prabhupada used to look at you, he, he could look at you in such a way that he could see you, <laughs> the soul. In other words, the way he would look at you was not in a judgmental way, but in a way of understanding exactly where you are, who you are, a little bit about you. Prabhupada was very, I can say, merciful. I want to tell one story, and this is in relationship to my dear God sister who just left her body a few days ago, Mother Krishna Nandini. Um, she told this story with Prabhupada, and this illustrates how, how, how compassionate and also how all-knowing Prabhupada was. Her mother, which was also, she was also a Prabhupada disciple. Um, and her, and along with some, a group of other black body devotees, um, they tried, they were living in Cleveland to become members of the Cleveland Temple. But Krishna Nandini's mother, she was quite, hmm, you might say, forceful, <laughs> to use a small word. <laughs> and so it never really manifested it and so the temple president didn't want them in the temple and told them to leave, you can't come back so they didn't know where to go so as Krishna Nandini was telling the story we just got in our car and this was in 1971 uh, no, actually 1972 and uh, we, we just started driving west from Cleveland, going west and we didn't know where we were going, but after about a day and a half of driving, and it was about seven of us in one car, we wound up at the da Dallas Temple. So when we came in, as she described, she was pregnant. Her mother was there. There was her brother and another devotee and others. They were a pretty worn-out, motley-looking group, <laughs> to use a, a few words. And the temple president was a little shocked, but he welcomed them. He said, all right, you can stay, but just today. Because we can't keep you more than one day. He called Cleveland, knowing where they came from. The Cleveland the temple president said, don't let them stay. They're troublemakers. <laughs> so he said, all right, but you can stay the today. But Prabhupada's coming tomorrow, so you'll have to be left by tomorrow. So, knowing Krishna Nandini's mother, I had personal association with her. <laughs> she doesn't go along with anybody's advice. <laughs> so she said, I'm worth staying. <laughs> We're not going. So the next day, Prabhupada came, and it was Radhastami, and it was scheduled initiations. So somehow, 
Krishna Nandini's mother got the got the opportunity to go meet Prabhupada, and she brought Krishna Nandini and a few of them with him. And they sat with Prabhupada, and she said how bad she wanted to become a devotee. Prabhupada listened. Next day, he told the same day he told the temple president, put them on the list, so they can get initiated. The temple president started to, you know, <laughs> object in a very strong way. Prabhupada said, when I see a spark, I like to fan it. <laughs> when I see a spark, I like to fan it. And the next day, they had no references. They had no record of any devotional service. Prabhupada gave them initiation on the spot. And it was amazing because all of them became great devotees. The mother was completely dedicated, gave her whole life. Krishna Nandini, we know. She wrote many books, preached so many places, and made so many devotees Krishna conscious. Her father, who left the world not long after that, also got initiated, along with one other devotee. So this was Prabhupada. He could see, well, here is someone. Maybe they're not following all the principles, of, but still... They, they are actually great potential for Krishna consciousness. That was Prabhupada's mercy. He could do that. And still, he would always be, won't we say, assured that his decision was the best. This is Srila Prabhupada. So, uh, I think my half hour is about ready to close. So, today is a day that we... We don't celebrate, but we honor. And the disappearance of the day of the spiritual master is not a day for celebration. It's a day for honoring that great personality who came into the world and did so much and made our lives, what we say, uh, uh, important. <laughs> In other words, he gave, us, he gave us life. He gave us real life. So it's kind of like a bittersweet day. The bitterness is that the, that personality is no longer here with us. So that is a principle of unhappiness, sadness. But still, the person is gone and back into the spiritual world. But we might also say, and I'll give a little quick, little quick story. Tamal Krishna Goswami Maharaj said to Srila Prabhupada, if there's, are there some devotees who never go back home to Godhead, who stay in the material world to preach? And Prabhupada got really animated in a very in a lively way. He said, yes. So I think Prabhupada was one such person that he would, wherever he, he he's somewhere in the, in the realm of material existence preaching Krishna consciousness. He had such compassion and so much desire to fulfill Lord Chaitanya's mission. So I thank you for the opportunity to speak a little bit about His Divine Grace. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Vishnu Braya Krishna Prasthaya Buddha, Srimati Bhakti Virata Swami Tiramane, Namaste Saraswatunde Ve, Gauravani Bajarane, Nirvi Shesha Srinivadi Paskadya De Sitarane. Sometimes we get a little hints about Srila Prabhupada's position, and uh, sometimes we don't connect all the dots together. We think that 
for instance, that sometimes Prabhupada knew what was going on, and sometimes he, we don't know what he was, his consciousness. But as Prabhupada wrote in 1968 to one devotee, Junardan, in, in Montreal, he said that the words of Srila Bhakti Dr. Kora are as good as scripture. Because he's a pure devotee. He said, just like Srimati Radharani, who is an Uttama Adhikari, Uttama Bhakta, she sometimes thinks that some of her associates are a better devotee than she is. Prabhupada said that the, generally the spiritual masters come from that category of devotees. But there are others who are not quite on that category. They can also take the role of a spiritual master if they're strictly following the disciple succession. And Prabhupada repeated that many times. But Prabhupada showed Krishna Shakti Vinanaya Tara Pravartana. He showed that he was actually an empowered representative of Krishna. Empowered representative of Krishna means that he was actually an instrument for Krishna. Now, sometimes the devotees get confused because they take Prabhupada's uh, instructions at different times and they seem to be contradictory. Or Prabhupada sometimes seem to say things that people don't appreciate. Are not politically correct. But actually this is not, as Prabhupada, one time he was on a morning walk with uh, Satsrup Maharaj and Jayadwaita Swami, and they asked him the question that Prabhupada, sometimes it appears that the spiritual master, he makes mistakes. So how we could to understand that? Sometimes he appears he, to, he, to fall asleep or to misquote some verse or whatever. So Prabhupada said, because you don't really understand what the Acharya is, therefore you think he's making mistakes. He's uh, Bhakti Shasana, which means you can tell the Acharya by his preaching. Now if Krishna said the same thing all the time, then he wouldn't be quite aware of what was going on according to time, place, and circumstance. So Prabhupada, he wrote in his books the general principles for the next 10,000 years. But in his, in his conversations, Prabhupada went with the flow. He was completely aware of the time, place, and circumstance. And he knew how to apply the philosophy for the purpose of fulfilling Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission that is helping people become Krishna conscious. Many times Prabhupada didn't want to contradict people, for an example, because otherwise he would have created a conflict. Prabhupada really avoided conflicts, unless it was absolutely necessary, or the person was qualified to get Prabhupada's mercy in that way. In any case, Prabhupada was expert it helping others become conscious of Krishna, and he preached accordingly. Although sometimes it appeared that he would be contradicting what he said previously. But if he said exactly what he was saying previously in a different time, place, and audience, that would have not been appropriate or exact as the super soul would have directed Prabhupada. So Prabhupada was actually directed by the super soul, and just as a point of information, as Maharaj said, the Prabhupada is present in his books, he's present in his uh, instructions, uh, he's also present here in his deity form, as much as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is present in his deity form, and although we may not be so much aware of it, but Krishna is 100% present in his pictures also. I had, when I first joined the movement, I had many experiences of Krishna have, as Prabhupada said, the windows into the spiritual world. And all of us can have that experience. Uh, Krishna is in every atom, so why can't he be in his pictures also? They're actually transcendental. And Prabhupada's just as much here in his deity form as he was here when he was so-called physically present. 
because Prabhupada was actually a manifestation of Krishna's energy, of his internal energy. A Prabhupada the soul, of course, is there, and Prabhupada the soul can also be expanded by Krishna into all his deity forms and into our heart if we follow his instructions. The transcendental devotees, they can expand themselves into multiple forms by Krishna's arrangement. Just as Krishna is having his pastimes in the spiritual world with Mother Jasoda, but in his, her different expansion, she comes here into the material world and takes part in his, his pastimes in different universes. So as Krishna is not limited, uh, these devotees, the pure devotees, are also not limited by Krishna's arrangement. Indeed, when we go back to the spiritual world, the followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they get two opportunities. One, to have Krishna's association in a particular form in Goloka Vrindavan, in the Vrindavan pastimes, and the other, we get a form, usually as a male form in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pastimes, in the part of Goloka Vrindavan where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu exists eternally and has his pastimes. So Prabhupada is also here, and as much as we serve Prabhupada then with the proper attitude and the proper devotion, then Krishna, then Prabhupada will reveal himself, as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu will also reveal himself to us in proportion to our service to the Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement. Uh, Prabhupada, he came as, uh, in, as a representative of our disciples' accession, as it says, Acharyamam Vidani Tam Navamanyata Karichit Namartya Sarabhuteshu Sarabhdeva Mayo Guru. That the spiritual master Krishna tells Uddhava that Acharyamam Vijaniyam Navamanyata Karichit. One should never disrespect Avamanyata Karichit. One should never respect the spiritual master because he's a representative of all the demigods. You should not think. He's an ordinary person subject to death. So Prabhupada and all the Acharyas are not subject to death. Uh, they never die. As I said, we may think their body has died, but no one's body is ever alive to begin with. So something that's dead can't die. And the soul, which is eternally alive, can't also die. So no one really dies. It just, they disappear from our sight. If we don't have the vision, as Krishna is here, present before us, in his deity form, or in the form of the holy name, so this Krishna Prabhupada is also here. He can also be in our heart. Just as Maharaj is from New Vrindavan, he's an old New Vrindavan devotee, he's still probably in New Vrindavan in his heart, <laughs> somewhat, <laughs> some part. There's a famous story of one, they had the, they still have the palace, and at one time, the leader of the Kirtananda Maharaj was, we, we have in, in leadership, we have what's called forming and storming. So it's kind of gone through some storming, maybe still be going through some storms. <laughs> so there was some, one lady was coming, the pilot was actually, I, I was there, actually I wrote an article, one of my BTG articles I wrote, I was a member of BTG, I was one of their writers for some time. My articles are still in BTG, they didn't take them out. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the articles I was sent by, I was, I was living in Philadelphia at that time, at the BTG the headquarters, and usually I write an article once every month or two months or something. So they sent me to New Vrindavan to write an article about the palace. So I went there and I stayed a week with Yamaraj and some others who was the photographer and the layout art. So I was interviewing Kirtananda Maharaj. This is when they were just building the palace. It's actually quite a nice experience being in New Vrindavan at that time. In any case, the, uh, there was some time when one lady came to visit the palace because there were getting a good number of visitors to come and see the palace, the palace of gold it was called. And
and she was going through the palace and she was somehow or another there were, there were many people there and she heard this voice she was in the part of the palace where they had Prabhupada's Murti and the voice said take my shoes and she was a Christian lady she never stole or anything <laughs> so she said what? what is this? and she heard the voice take my shoes shoe just one shoe there was only one shoe there From the shoe. <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, she thought, well, I, can't, I better take the shoes. <laughs> so she took the shoes and she hid them and she disappeared. She took one shoe, only once. Hmm. Anyhow, she took one shoe. I guess she was lonely. <laughs> she needed someone to talk to. <laughs> so then she took the shoe, or whatever. She took the shoe, and then at, after that, Nubrandavan left Iskhan for some time. And then some years went by, and then the shoe talked to her again. I guess maybe she was, what's that? Yeah, maybe she, the shoe kept on talking to her, but then <laughs> he, she got a dream. And the shoe said, take me back. <laughs> so she came and she, New Vrindavan rejoined Iskhan and the shoe, what's that? She was embarrassed, so she mailed it. She mailed it. Anyway, the shoe came back. <laughs> so how did this happen? Well, unless you believe in talking shoes. <laughs> Actually, what was ta Krishna or Prabhupada was talking to her. So Prabhupada can also talk to us. As Prabhupada said, if you become qualified, then Krishna will talk to you. Just like the Brahmin was in the story of Shakshi Gopal. The two Brahmins were on pilgrimage and the elder Brahmin was very much impressed by the, Bra the younger Brahmin's service, and he said, I'd like to give you my daughter in charity, in marriage. And the younger Brahmin said, no, no, that's not possible. That time, because there was more of a stringent social structure at that time, a poor man generally couldn't marry a rich man's uh, daughter. In any case, he said, I, I'm not learned. Learned meant at that time you could chant the Vedas, Rig Veda, Sama Veda. Yeah, I, I'm not learned, nor do I have any money. It would be inappropriate for me to marry your daughter. But the elder Brahmin said, no, no, it's all right. And as you might have heard, there was some, um, the, the younger Brahmin took the elder Brahmin before Gopal because they were in Vrindavan. And he said, you have to promise before Gopal as the witness, Shakshi Gopal. Because he realized the younger Brahmin, there's going to be some objections from the family. Not that, so the elder Brahmin promised before Gopal that he was going to give his daughter in charity to this younger Brahmin. The time came, the elder Brahmin didn't give his daughter because he, came, he called his family together. And he said, my dear family, I was on pilgrimage with this young Brahmin, and I promised him my daughter in charity. And they said, what? He's this, this man has no money. He's not learned. He, he's not, he can't do that. So the wife said, if you, if you do that, I'm going to take poison and kill myself. <laughs> and others said similar things in his family. So the, the elder Brahman was perplexed. So he said, what can I do? I promise I can't break my word. He said, that's all right. When the old, young Brahmin comes, just tell him that you were, you know, you can't remember. May have happened, may not have happened. He just can't remember what happened. And I'll take care of the rest. So the young Brahmin came and he said, you know, What's happening? You ask, you promised me your daughter in charity. You don't say anything. What, what? So the 
the elder Brahmin didn't say anything and the younger, his son came with a stick and said, you rascal, why are you trying to take my, my sister? We know what you did. You fed my, my father some datura. You made him crazy. And now you stole his money on pilgrimage. And now you're trying to take his daughter. You rascal. And he chased after him with a stick. The younger Brahmin fled, went to the village and said, actually, the elder Brahmin, he would like to tell the truth, but he's afraid of the reaction from his family. But the elder Brahmin promised me his daughter in charity, in marriage. The villagers went there and said, well, what's going on? And the elder Brahmin didn't say anything. The younger Brahmin said, well, you know, this guy's a rascal. He stole my father's money, gave him poison. Now he wants to take his daughter. And the younger Brahmin said, no, no, that's not what happened. This is all false, that it's not true at all. And I have a witness. Gopal and Vrindavan is my witness. And the younger, the Brahmin's younger uh, son said, oh, really, Gopal's your witness, huh? Good luck, all right. We accept him as a witness. You bring him here. And if he comes here and he says, he was a witness to this contract, then we'll accept it. And the younger Brahman said, good, let's go for it. And everyone said, yeah, yeah, go for it. And the, younger, the elder Brahman said, yeah, that's right, let's go. So the younger Brahman walked to, to Vrindavan. He came before Gopal. And he said, Gopal, you have to come here as a witness, you know, the, to protect the honor of the elder Brahman. So Gopal said, well, you know, I, I was a witness. And Gopal said, yeah, and the younger Brahmin said, yes, if you don't, you'll get sinful reactions. <laughs> You're a witness, and if you don't testify, you're going to get a reaction for it. <laughs> Such is the intimate relationship between Krishna and his devotees. And he said, but the deity said, well, you know, I'm a deity. Deities don't, they don't walk. Really. You know, they never heard of a deity walking. He said, I'll come as a four-armed Vishnu form and give testimony. He said, no, no, no. Even if you come a four-armed Vishnu form, no one's going to believe you. you got to come personally. So Gopal said, well, how can I come? I'm a deity. He said, well, if you can talk, you can walk. <laughs> so Gopal thought about it and he said, well, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> so he said, I'll, I'll, I'll accompany you, but I'm going to come behind. And you can't turn back. If you turn, wherever, whenever you turn back, then I'm going to stay in exactly that place. So you just walk ahead. You'll hear my ankle bell, so you'll know I'm there. And you cook one kilo of rice every day for me. And then, so, they walk, they walk, they come to this, what is that place in South India? And Vidyanagar. And the Brahmin doesn't hear the ankle bells anymore. So they're almost in the village, they're just outside the village where this whole, where the Brahmin lives, the elder Brahmin. So he turns around and there's Gopal smiling at him. And then he goes and calls all the villages and indeed Gopal actually acts as a witness. Now of course you could have said, well maybe he hired a truck. <laughs> he brought him there. <laughs> There were, or a rickshaw or something, super rickshaw. <laughs> but that's not what, obviously, but the fact that he gave witness, he just didn't come there, he actually, he actually gave a witness, so no one could actually doubt him. And he said, oh no, you, you carried him here, you know, four ton deity, you carried him. No. But he actually testified. So Krishna can talk, there's, and their pure devotees can also talk. In uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pastimes, at Katori, the festival of Katori, when Janavi Devi Dasi was there, during that festival they had they installed the Panchatattva deities, and it said that during the festival, that when the devotees were ecstatically dancing, the deities came down and danced with them also. Just like we have Srinivasacharya here, 
who's actually an, an incarnation of Narada Muni. So, Krishna's devotees, we have three Vishnu expansion, well, three in the Vishnu category, one the internal energy and the, the other a pure Brahman, and they're all transcendentally here. So, Prabhupada's also here. Uh, Prabhupada's, we say he's here in his instructions, and to, his instructions are non different from the super soul. Non different from the super soul is non different from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. This is the age of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And our mission is to dovetail our existence with the mission of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. If we dovetail our, mission, our existence with the mission of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, that's called becoming an instrument. So Prabhupada was a perfect instrument for Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And that instrument was to turn us, us into instruments also to explain what the mission of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is. It's a very personal mission. It's to bring, as Prabhupada wrote to me one time, the more seriously you work to help bring Krishna's other children back to the spiritual kingdom, then the more he'll bestow all his blessings upon you. That Krishna is never ungrateful for our efforts to serve him, rest assured. If we want to meet Krishna in this lifetime, or in some future lifetime, we want to meet Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the Panchatattva and our acharyas and disciples' succession. Simply, we have to be, work seriously in some way to bring Krishna's other children back to the spiritual kingdom. That doesn't only mean people on the outside, it means also people on the devotees on the inside also. Whoever we meet, if we're serious about Krishna consciousness, then Krishna will give us the intelligence how to instruct or give a good example to others to inspire them to become closer to our acharyas and disciples' succession and ultimately to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And as much as we dovetail our lives in this age with the mission of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the Panchatattva, to that extent, automatically we'll experience separation from Radha and Krishna and Vrindavan. And in that way, we'll actually be with Radha and Krishna and Vrindavan. There's no difference between feeling separation from Krishna or his devotees and actually directly associating with him. According to our philosophy, such feelings of separation are actually more intimate association. So it's a question of, for instance, every day we have our Guru Puj, and we may think it's some kind of ritual or something, but actually it's a great opportunity for us to actually get Prabhupada's personal association in a way that we're actually become, saying words which should remind us of what Prabhupada, who Prabhupada is and what his position is. And if we understand what we're doing and we say those words in the pro with the proper understanding and feeling, then we'll actually see how Prabhupada is personally present here right now. Now the, the problem is that we're not present. We're somewhere. <laughs> we don't even know where we are half the time. <laughs> but Krishna and Prabhupada know where we're at and therefore they're patiently giving us this opportunity to find out where they're at and when we find out where they're at we'll find out where we're at also. Or we make an effort to utilize this, our energies in their service, then gradually, didami buddhi yogam tam, Krishna will reveal these things to us. Now, friends, I had some association with Prabhupada in different places, and I was a temple president for most of the, many, most of the time, and so I was able to, you know, and even when I was in, wasn't a temple president at the beginning, it was expected that you, you know, we were supposed to have personal association with Prabhupada, and so I got uh, an opportunity to be with Prabhupada in different places, sometimes for hours at a time. And Prabhupada, sometimes there was no one else there except for me, <laughs> and Prabhupada would be talking to me. And uh, he, for my experience with Prabhupada, he knew exactly where I was at, even when my, when my mind would go on places where Prabhupada didn't like it to be. <laughs> I remember one time I was sitting there with Prabhupada who was talking to me for a couple of hours in Buffalo in 1969. 
And I was a mystic, I was trying to become a mystic yogi at that time before I joined the movement. <laughs> well, you know, we all had associate. I mean, I was one of the early devotees to get into things like Hatha Yoga and all these different things. And I actually had some mystic experiences. But in any case, I was, you know, I was a little bit of a yogi at that time. So I was sitting there, and I, one of the things of yoga was to see people's auras. So I was sitting there, and Prabhupada actually had, he was effulgent. So I was sitting there looking at Prabhupada's effulgence. And Prabhupada looked at me and said, our process is bhakti, it's not yoga. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> And from his letters and from his instructions, I mean, it was as good as being with the super soul. The, uh, as Maharaj pointed out, I remember one time Robert, I was, I was in Boston in 1969, and some devotees went to the airport to pick Prabhupada up, but I, I stayed back. We came from Buffalo, we went to Buffalo, to New York, I went to visit my, I went to, uh, my, my sister was getting married and I walked into my parents' uh, apartment and they saw me, they didn't know I was a devotee. They saw me with these robes on and a shaven head and my mother was like, you know, she practically had her heart attack. <laughs> and she said, you can't be in here like that. So I said, no problem. <laughs> so I just, turned around and went out the door. <laughs> I was a little callous. <laughs> I mean, and anyhow, so I went down the elevator and they met me down the, they got down the ele other elevator. They said, no, no, at least for your sister's wedding, it's all right. <laughs> so I went to my sister. And then we went to Boston. The devotees were there. They went on Harinam in New York. There's a picture in the back to Godhead. Everyone was there except for me. Because I was at my sister's wedding, <laughs> I preached to my relatives at their wedding. So I went. We went there, and I was probably was coming, and I was up with the other devotees in the second floor. It was a Boston. It was in Beacon Street, and it was the first temple. which had two floor. You know, had big temple. Big one. One floor was a temple room, and downstairs they installed Iskon Press. So it was quite a prestigious place. And Prabhupada walked up the steps. I remember right before Prabhupada walked up the steps, there's this, still if you go to the Beacon Street, the temple in Boston, Commonwealth Avenue, if you see the picture, there's a picture of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's arms out and the Kirtan party is in the back and they had that hanging on, you know, on, on top of the stairs. And I was looking at the picture, and the picture became effulgent. I said, wow, that's pretty... I guess he's really liking the, the, the kirtan here. He became really effulgent. And then Prabhupada walked up the steps, and the whole room turned into Vaikuntha. I was like, you know, a completely different world. And I, I, I would imagine everyone in that room were, was also in Vaikuntha. Because I, I couldn't even remember what I was worrying about. I couldn't even remember what I was thinking about. I was just, wow. And Prabhupada sat down and he sat down and then he, he looked at me and I could see, he could actually see who I actually am. And then he gave a lecture which was not recorded on Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada for almost 45 minutes, told all the pastimes of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada. And it was the only time one of the very rare times I ever heard Prabhupada was just giving pastimes, especially about his spiritual master. And for 45 minutes, I was just crying. I didn't, I mean, I'm usually not very sentimental, at least <laughs> externally. <laughs> but I just, but it, it, I mean, I, I was, sometimes I was with Prabhupada, but, you know, Prabhupada's effect was such that at least upon me, I mean, I just, I, I was in a whole different places at some times. No, it was never recorded. 
Yeah, it was just, uh, I don't know why. There maybe, you know, I'll have to see, because I remember it, Shravani, I think it was Shravani, what, there's one Madhuri, she walked up the steps. She came up and probably to her and said, don't fight with your husband. Yeah, I couldn't ask one. <laughs> I can't remember. That. In any case, the uh, you know, Prabhupada was a transcendental personality, and we were able to perceive him according to our whatever mercy of God, whatever our level of consciousness is. Then it was perceived. Uh, we have really very little idea, at least I have very little idea, actually what spiritual world, what spiritual life actually is. We're practicing to become to the platform of getting a little glimpse, a little t a little drop from the ocean of devotional service. But we get different, one of the things the devotees like to hear about is pastimes, because they get a little revelation, a little taste what it's like to be a pure devotee or in the association of a pure devotee and what it's like to be an instrument for Krishna so that one is able to deal with so many different people and actually inspire them. I mean, I'm as one prophet once gave me instruction, I think it was a letter or he told me personally, he said, don't try and teach you, oh, that was in that, when prophet was talking to me, he said, don't try and teach your God brother's lessons. Because I was, I was a pure devotee, assigned to instruct everyone. <laughs> and probably didn't give me that instruction. I, that was what I was supposed to do. So I kept it quiet. I just instructed them indirectly. <laughs> But Prabhupada was uh, his, well, we'll get, get little glimpse, glimpses, but we should understand that Prabhupada's books, they're perfect, and Prabhupada's instructions in his talks, his walks, everything's perfect. The problem is that we have to become perfect to understand it. And the more we do, the more we become instruments, the more we faith we develop in Prabhupada. And even those who are initiating spiritual masters, etc. Now, whatever faith we have in them is good, as long as that faith is connected with the Sipha succession. As Prabhupada was connected with the Sipha succession, and therefore he didn't take credit for doing anything independently of his Guru Maharaj. I remember one time I heard that instruction in 69 that Prabhupada was always remembering his Guru Maharaj. I thought, wow, I would like really like to do that. And for one day, the whole day, I was remembering Prabhupada, because it didn't last more than that. But for the whole day, I was actually, and I thought, wow. Prabhupada, but Prabhupada, because he was on that level, he was always in, with his Guru Maharaj, not just remembering him. He was actually with his Guru Maharaj, and with him, in his Guru Maharaj's heart, was his Guru Maharaj, in other words, he was the whole, wherever Prabhupada went, whatever he was doing, he was actually with the entire disciple's accession, including Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Krishna and the spiritual world. They were all there. And it wasn't just sometimes, it was all the time. We may understand or we may not understand, uh, but we have to develop that, we should develop that understanding so that we can join with Prabhupada and become a suitable instrument so that we come to the same level wherever we are. Vidad Vidas Bhagavatas Tirta Bhutak Suyam Vibho Tirta Bhutani Bhutani Yantak Stena Vrita Vritaha That saints like yourself, they're verily holy places of pilgrimage. Mahajuda Sir told Vidura when he came back after pilgrimage. Because wherever you go, you turn that place into a place of pilgrimage because you carry Krishna within your heart. So Prabhupada, even here, he's carrying Krishna in the whole spiritual world. As Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is here, uh, they're all 
on the same level of consciousness, the same level of spiritual existence, and we're being, give, being given the opportunity to participate in their leela. This is actually Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's leela we're participating in, and join that leela if we take it serious, as much as we take it seriously, this leela, then we'll join it and we'll enter into the eternal pastimes of, not in the future, but even this lifetime, if we take the Sankirtan movement seriously. So thank you. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada Dhirva Mahatsava Ki. His Holiness Pradhanana Samaharaj Ki. His Holiness Chandramani Maharaj Ki. So, thank you very much for these very inspiring words. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, the next uh, program. Okay, so let's sing Jenny Lal. No, Jenny Lal. Can you sing? Yeah, afterwards. Oh, okay. Yeah. So should we turn here? Yeah, we should do it in front of Prabhupada. Where's the book? You know which you find it? You have some sparse about it. Okay. We can we can do it like this. Okay. We can sit down for this one too. Mm -hmm. So this is the time, actually, I'm not sure, it's either 7.25 or 7.35 on this day of the anniversary that Srila Prabhupada departed the mortal world. So it's very appropriate that we sing this particular song at this particular time. And this is by Srila Narottam Das Thakur. This is a very deep and heartfelt song, so please try to sing as much with much as tension and and uh, emotion. Okay, so uh, you want to read the translation? And my my book doesn't have the translation in it. It does, but it does. It's the words I can't understand. Give me a few years, now maybe I'll <laughs> a few lifetimes. Maybe another birth. Okay. Prinesel je zaklad božanske ljubezni in je bil poln sočutja in milosti. Kje sta moja svarup Damodar in rupa Gosvami? Kje je Sanatana? Kje je Ragunat Dasa, odrešitelj padlih duš? Kje sta moja Ragunat Bata in Gopal Bata? In kje je Krišna Das Kavirač? Kam je nenadoma očel gospod Govranga, veliki plesalec? Z glavo bom obdaril ob kamen, stopil bom v ogen, le kje bom našel gospoda Govrango ocean vseh čudovitih lasnosti? Ker se ne more družiti z gospodom Govrango in z vsemi baktami, s katerimi je gospod uprizoril svoje zabave, lahko narota Madasa leji oče. So, I remember when Prabhupada left and we all got the news, immediately we all gathered together in Nuvrindavan and then uh, His Holiness Radhana Swami led us in singing this particular song as soon as we had received the news of Prabhupada's departure. Hmm. 
Sangana paya kande hai saro tamudha His divine grace, H.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. 